This is a continuation of our series of recordings on mixture designs. In the previous recording, we talked about the situation where we have lower bound constraints and possibly upper bound constraints on the ingredients or mixture components. So there are many cases where at least some amount of some of the ingredients must be present and sometimes there are upper bounds on how much can be present. So the best way to illustrate this is to use an example. So we're going to work through an example for something called a safety flare mixture experiment. This is actually a published case study and it's actually ideal for explaining the concept of constrained mixtures and how to analyze them. So they're making safety flares and there are four ingredients, magnesium, sodium nitrate, strontium nitrate, and a binder. And you will notice from slide 21, each of them has a lower and an upper bound. Example, the magnesium runs from 40% to 60%, the binder from 3% to 8%. So this is again called a constrained mixture design the response is lumens, uh, measure, yeah, lumination measured in lumens. Okay. And on slide uh, 22, just for illustration, this is what the region looks like, the constrained region. And we call it a four-dimensional polytope, three-dimensional, sorry. We have the mixture constraint. The full mixture region is the tetrahedron. But we're going to fit our model in this small region. And again, we're going to have the problem that if we fit a Chaffee polynomial in this small region, the model is extrapolated to the entire region. Therefore, we're once again going to use the concept of L pseudocomponents or U pseudocomponents to do some rescaling. And primarily, we're going to work through this experiment in the JUMP software. Okay. By the way, this is the 15-run design, um, which is uh, basically the one JUMP would give you. And this is the old-fashioned type of design. Uh, you can read the notes for details. I'm not going to cover it, called an extreme vertice design. It's almost twice as big. So the advent of software like JUMP allows us to run much more efficient experiments. Okay, so what I'm going to do at this point is go over to JUMP and we'll talk about the analysis. So here is the design and I want to in the column info window notice it's a mixture JUMP has picked up on the lower and upper bounds. This is for magnesium. And notice the check marks. It will do either L pseudocomponent or U pseudocomponent. Generally, what you're going to see, it does the pseudocomponent rescaling automatically. And I'll show that in a moment. Okay. So both of these have the uh, mixture properties. In fact, all four of them have the correct properties. If you want to take a look just to make sure, and there's binder. Okay. And there's some other columns. And I'm going to skip the discussion. You should read the part two notes on what's called the Cornell-Gorman rescaling. It is an alternative to L pseudocomponent scaling. And I reference a paper where it comes from. I happen to like this rescaling. Unfortunately, JUMP doesn't support it. But I've included it in the data table. And you have a copy of it. And I show you how to write JUMP formulas to do the rescaling. So you have this as a reference. You can go back and review the notes to see how it's done. And later, I'll show you um, some characteristics of these, why we, we like that rescaling. So first, I'm going to go to Fit Model. Okay. 
and the response is lumens. I'll highlight my four factors and under macros I'm going to pick mixture response surface. Again it does not include three-way terms and this design originally was not created to estimate three-way nonlinear blending. I wish it had. So we're not going to look for it. Well similar to what I showed uh, in the second or third recording, it is hard to analyze this design. If I click run, okay, we get the output. Okay, there's a parameter estimates table. And you get these various tests. Warning, in general these tests are not reliable because of all the correlation. And notice by default Jump did the L pseudo component rescaling. So this model is being fit in the rescaled mode. Okay. If you wanted to see the model without it, I'd have to go back and remove the property. So I'm not going to bother. Uh, I do show you in the notes and the coefficients are really uh, uninterpretable. Even with the scaling, notice a couple of terms in particular. Nonlinear blending terms with binder. Look at the size of the effect, which makes no sense at all. The scale is what, 100 and something to 400 and something lumens. They're very negative, and look at the standard errors, they're huge. Okay. So the typical approach to analysis using hypothesis tests will not really work. And if you wanted to see some of the correlation, if you go to <coughs> In the main report menu, the estimates menu, and then correlation of estimates. Okay. Notice huge correlation. And by the way, if we had not done the pseudo component rescaling, these correlations would be even worse, believe it or not. So we have highly correlated estimates, and we have coefficients that make no sense. In other words, trying to sort out what these mean uh, is impossible. In fact, look at the coefficient for magnesium. It's predicting minus 208 um, lumens. Again, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, so I guess the flare is absorbing light, sort of like a black hole. But the point is, uh, we don't necessarily need to exactly um, interpret the coefficients. Our primary concern is prediction. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go back to fit model, hit recall, but this time I showed you earlier stepwise. So I'm going to go to the stepwise platform and see if forward selection can help us simplify the model. So I'm going to begin with the BIC. Again, as I showed earlier, all four pure components must be in the model by definition given this is a mixture. So I'm just going to go ahead. There are no terms other than that in the model. This is the direction is forward and I want to minimize BIC. So I take a step and it adds the nonlinear blending of the two nitrates. So I'm just going to go ahead and click go and let it pick a model. So it's left out two of the nitrate terms. So I click run model. Okay. And that opens a fit group, which was described earlier. I'm going to remove the terms and then let's try a minimum AIC model. Again, I'll click Go, and it's come up with an even smaller model. As I said, AIC and BIC criteria often do not agree. Okay. So I'm going to run the model. It gets added to my fit group. And what we can do at this point is take a look at our two models and see if one predicts better than the other. Again, I won't get into full details right now, 
But let's take a look at the second model. This one is pretty simple. So I will, I'm going to call up the profiler and call up desirability functions from the profiler menu. And let's assume, and I think we would, we would want to maximize output. So maximize desirability. And it's indicating about the maximum, 60% magnesium. So it maxes that out, 18% sodium nitrate, 14 percent strontium nitrate, and interestingly it wants to max out binder. Okay, so that's using the simpler AIC model. Let's go up to our first model. This is the BIC model. It has more terms in it. Okay. So I'm going to again call up the profiler. And from the profiler, I'm going to get the desirability functions, and then maximize desirability. Okay. Notice this has given us a different solution. Okay. So this one's 53% mag, 23% strontium nitrate, I'm sorry, sodium nitrate, 17% strontium nitrate, 8% binder. So you're saying, well, these aren't really okay, similar. No, they're not. Uh, they're giving you different formulations. Although, if you take a look, not off by much. I think they're a little different. Let me take a second look. I may be incorrect. In point of fact, they actually match. So frankly, I'm going to use the simpler model. There's less correlation, it's likely to be more stable, and it's giving us exactly the same prediction of what would be the optimum formula. And as I showed you earlier, I'm going to actually, let's see if I want to or not. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call up the mixture profiler. So let's look at the mixture profiler. And what's interesting, this gives you an idea of the shape of the region. Of course, um, I really need another dimension, but it frankly does a good job of taking slices through the design region. So notice right now I'm taking a slice in the binder. Well, I would say trans, I'm thinking about how we would do it. Um, or let's say this would be, I think it would be orthogonal to the binder direction. And you can see how narrow the direction is in binder. So the binder coefficients and interactions are, have, are large extrapolations. Okay. So they're not well estimated. And then you can see in other directions what the surface looks like. Okay. So basically, that is the approach to analyzing a constrained mixture experiment. And for now, and we'll learn some other tools later, uh, forward selection is a reasonable approach. What is not really useful is the idea of uh, using p-values and hypothesis tests. There's just simply too much correlation among the estimates.